Law 578, Law of Evidence 2, Opinion Evidence, Lecture 3. In our previous lecture, we basically have looked into Section 45 that relates to opinion evidence. We have looked at the distinction between evidence of facts and evidence of opinion. We also have looked into the definition of an expert. Yeah, The four kind of situation in which you require an expert. And also, we have looked into the process in which you are tendering evidence of an expert in the court, where the case of Junaidi basically have asked you two questions. Yeah, that is, does the nature of the evidence require special skill? If it does, does the person that you call here has the necessary qualification? And in today's lecture, we are going to look at into conflicting expert opinion. Right? Matters relating to conflicting expert opinion is where you have two parties here, the plaintiff or the defendant, the prosecution or the accused person, both of them are calling expert in the court yeah, to give evidence on their part. Now when you look at, when we recall the lecture previously, when you talk about the question number one, that is in the case of Junaidi, yeah, whether the nature of the case here requires you to bring expert in the court, remember for this question, it is up for the judge to decide whether he wants to have an expert or it is up to the counsel to determine whether they require an expert to prove or disprove facts. So when you talk about the counsel here, you may have just now the plaintiff or the, the prosecution of the plaintiff may want to call their expert witness. You can also have the defendant or the accused person here or the defendant to give or to call their expert to give evidence in the court. So if they find that there is a need for them to call an expert, they may do so because it is a privilege of the person calling the witness. Now, if you have more than one person giving evidence, you may have a situation of conflicting experts' opinion. So in, if such situation exists, then it is up to the court to prefer which one of the expert, right? The court has to evaluate both conflicting expert opinion in the sense that, remember when you have an expert, whenever they are giving your opinion, they may, must give reasons for their opinion. That will be under section 51. When they give reasons for the opinion, the judge will evaluate both reasoning, both uh, scientific justification of their evidence and at the end of the day it is up to the judge to choose to choose which one of these two opinion that it wants to follow right this is actually provided for in the case of Singapore Finance Limited against Lim Kah Ngam as well as in the case of Wong Sui Chi where at the end of the day it will be for the court to decide which opinion to choose now, if you have a situation of conflicting expert opinion, I think it's best that we look at how the court, um, the court address issues of conflicting expert opinion. The best case to look at will be the case of Nilai, Three Porcelain, Sundiyam Berhad, uh, in por uh, Porcelain in Sundiyam Berhad against Berjaya, Sompo. Now, this is a civil case, right? This is a civil case where you have Nilai Tri Porcelain, he is the plaintiff, and Bajaya Sompo is the, the defendant. Now, what happened here is, so Nilai Tri Porcelain is actually, uh, you have some factory premises in Nilai. They are operating businesses of making porcelain and making materials for wedding. Now, what happened here is that one day, this particular premises owned by Nilai Tri Porcelain caught fire. Right, it was caught on fire, and the issue here is whether the fire was actually caused by short circuit or electric wiring, or whether it was caused by an arson. Now, when you refer to the process, yeah, the test in the case of Junaidi, the first question that you have to answer is 
whether the nature of this particular case require an expert. Now, in the case of Nilay Porcelain 3, the judge has to determine whether the cause of fire is as a result of uh, arson or whether it is by short circuit. So by naked eye, the judge will not be able to determine this. Because of that, right, the parties and the judge themselves believe that they require an expert. So basically what happened in this case, yes, they cannot decide on their own. They need to have an expert witness testifying in the court. Now in this case, basically, both the plaintiff and the defendant is calling their own expert. The plaintiff here is basically is basically calling the expert which are officers from the fire department that come to the scene of the crime immediately upon the fire. Now what happened, save the facts and issue here. So the fire katakala took place on the 1st of January 2020. Right? So when the fire was caught, it was at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. So when the fire broke out, the fire, fire engine department came by and they will stop the fire and immediately upon that, officers from the fire department will do examination at the scene to determine what is actually the cause of fire. So the examination made by this PW here who is an expert from the fire department is actually to look throughout the entire premises to find for the cause of fire in which they say that the cause of fire here is as a result of the uh, short circuit of electric wiring how will they know they know by virtue of looking at the wires they have been uh, evidence of intense heat on the surrounding the short circuit therefore by virtue of this evidence Basically, they thought that it is not by way of uh, arson, it is by way of um, a fire circuit, yeah? short fire circuit. Now, so that is the evidence that is standard, that is given by the expert yeah? from the fire department. The next day, on the 2nd of January 2020, of course the date is going to be different if you read the actual case. The next day, you have the defendant here sending his own expert this particular witness here collected sample from the premises and the sample is actually kept within with her and she sent it to the chemist to determine right the sample to look at the sample and the chemist basically found that there have been traces of gasoline right kerosene right there's traces of kerosene at the sample to indicate to to indicate that there is a possibility that the fire was actually caused by uh, arson yeah the use of kerosene now what happened here okay so the, the issue now so you have in this situation number one this matter is very difficult. The judge cannot decide by naked eye. So the judge requires an expert. So that's why they call an expert. You have the prosecute, sorry, you have the plaintiff expert, plaintiff expert from the fire department. You also have the defendant expert, yeah, which uh, which is a private individual. Now, if you have this one, how did the court decide whether or not these persons are expert? Now, when the court look at this situation. Of course, there will be process of examination in chief, cross and re-examination by the counsels of both parties to determine the qualification. So what happened here? The plaintiff lawyer is doing the examination in chief on the expertise of uh, the fire, the fire uh, department uh, officer and cross-examined by the defendant counsel, re-examined by, uh, by the uh, plaintiff counsel and found that this uh, fire department officer is a person who has seven years in experience and has attended 200 courses and has investigated more than 7,000 cases. And, and his evidence has been given in court and the court has accepted it. So the court, when looking at the qualification of 
the officer from the fire department believed that he is an expert. And when the defendant lawyer, when the defendant witness is called, so this defendant witness is also of some credible uh, qualification. Therefore, upon examination in chief cross and re-examination, the court also believed that DW here, an expert called by the defendant, is also an expert. So because he she has the necessary qualification. So you have here PW uh, expert from the plaintiff and expert from the defendant. Both of them were regarded by the court to be an expert. So the issue here, since both of them are experts, how will the court decide which one to follow? Now, basically in the case of Nilaitri Porcelain, the court said that in deciding which, in deciding which um, opinion that the court has to follow, the court need to test the versions of both of the witnesses here based on their oral evidence against the contemporaneous documents and overall circumstances. So it means that evidence given by the fire officer of the fire department and the evidence given by the defendant expert here, when they testify orally in the court, the court will have to assess their evidence based on whatever document that they can produce and based on whatever evidence that was found at the scene of the fire. And to decide on this point, the court basically referred to the case of Guan Teik Sendiran Berhad against Haji Muhammad No, where in this case, the court says that in cases involving conflicting expert witnesses, it is the duty of the court, number one, yeah, is to weigh the evidence, is to weigh the evidence of both experts, yeah, expert witnesses of the plaintiff and expert witnesses of the defendant on the balance of probabilities. Right? On the balance of probabilities. Number two, the court will also need to look at, the court cannot only look at their evidence per se, the court will also need to look at all surrounding factors. Right? The court need to look at all surrounding factors concerning their evidence. And number three, the court need to weigh and evaluate and evaluate all contemporaneous document to establish the truth as to what could have transpired on that particular day. So meaning to say that when evaluating evidence of the expert from the, uh, from the plaintiff or the expert from the defendant, the court need to look at the whole situation to determine which one of these two could have been telling who could have been uh, giving uh, of opinion which are closest to the truth with respect to the cause of fire when you relate back to the case of Nilai Porcelain. So what happened in the case of Nilai Porcelain here, when the, when the court used this particular three uh, 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 methods of evaluation, the court eventually decided to opt and follow the evidence of an expert given by the plaintiff witnesses, that is the evidence of the fire department officer. Because there's no problem that both of them are experts. It has been proven by their evidence in the court. But the court says that the reasons why I choose, um, I choose to follow expert witnesses that is produced by the plaintiff is because Number one, besides the skill and everything, the court believed that he was conducting the investigation objectively, diligently, thoroughly. The court also considered the fact that the fire officer, the fire department officer came to the scene immediately upon fire and the evidence was collected on the same day the fire erupted. And Remember, when they do their examination, their aim is actually to determine the cause of fire. And the court basically compare this with the evidence given by the defendant witness. 
The court says that the defendant witness here took the sample the next day. So it is not actually immediately on the day of fire, but it was the next day. And number two, the sample was actually kept by the uh, defendant expert and only given two days later to the lab. Why is that happening? That happened because it was over the weekend. So the sample was taken and kept before it was sent to the chemist. And the court furthermore says that when the defendant expert here take the sample, the defendant here took the sample limited for the purpose of determining whether the cause of fire was deliberate or not. So that is, on that point, the court says that this is not so objective compared to the one that is uh, done by the um, expert from the fire department and the court says that, right, we, uh, the court decided to follow the opinion given by the first witness, right? Having said that, the court, upon that evaluation, upon that conclusion, so the court basically employed the opinion given by the, the expert from the fire department and concluded that there were no arson. Even though Nilay Triposin may have some financial problem, that you cannot use that to assume that they have caused the fire. You got that? So that is how the court in Nilay Tree Porcelain decided in, two, in assessing two conflicting expert opinion. Right? In addition to that, right, so that is how it goes. Now let's look at another case that have conflicting expert opinion. You have the case of Anwar Ibrahim, Sodomitu. You have Anwar Ibrahim, Sodomitu. If you recall the case of Anwar Ibrahim, Sodomitu, remember the victim was, uh, uh, the sample was taken from Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, the sample was taken actually in the cell and it was taken from the mineral water bottle and it was taken from the good morning towel that he used and from the toothbrush, right? And the sample taken is actually sent to the chemist and the chemist is doing the evaluation of this particular evidence so what the chemist did was actually took the sample make an analysis on the actual sample evaluate it and make some tests and come to a decision that this is Anwar Ibrahim's sample and another sample that was taken from the victim Saiful is was taken by the doctor, remember you have Saiful here, went to the hospital, his sample taken by uh, doctor number one and doctor number two, right, taken from the upper body and from the lower body, doctor number three basically uh, tag it, put inside a bag and send it to doctor number four, who is in the chemistry department, who analyzed the sample and match it with the one in Danua Ibrahim. So Mr. X Sample that was taken from Saiful, you have DNA of Saiful and DNA of Mr. X and DNA of Mr. X here match that Anwar Ibrahim. So the issue now here, D4 here is the one that is giving evidence in the court relating to the test or analysis that he did on the sample to confirm that it, this is actually Anwar Ibrahim's sample. So, so this is a doctor, this is the chemist who do the analysis on the sample and confirm the DNA to be Anwar Ibrahim. So that what happened. So you have the plaintiff here calling that expert, your PW, who is an expert who did the analysis on the sample to give evidence in the court which confirmed the sample was DNA of Anwar Ibrahim. Right? Anwar Ibrahim. So you have, on the other hand, Anwar Ibrahim, so the defense, so you have Anwar Ibrahim basically call his own expert. He basically called, right, experts from a professor from Harvard, right, to give evidence relating to DNA. Now, you have to remember this Harvard professor here did not do any analysis on the sample. What he did was actually to look at the process in which PW, yeah, in which prosecution expert here giving uh, how is the process done by the 
uh, D4 here in analyzing the sample. So he was actually looking at the report as to how D4 here analyzed the sample and he is giving opinion relating to the process. He himself did not do the analysis. So he, he basically, of course, in this context, when the matter goes to court, determination of the of Anu Ibrahim is very important. So you need to have an expert. So question number one in Junaidi's case confirmed. So we need an expert. So now that in this, uh, the second question, does the expert have qualification? Yes, during examination chief cross and re-examination of all these witnesses, both of them were confirmed to be expert. So now the issue here, when both of them are giving evidence in the court, which one of the opinion that is actually should be taken by the court yeah, in coming to a decision. Now in the context of this kind of evidence, you have two conflicting evidence here. The court in making a decision, yeah, on appeal, the court in making the decision says that the DNA evidence by the expert from the defense part, so you have the Harvard professor here, he did not do the analysis on the sample. He is only acquiring knowledge and expertise relating to DNA and sample by reading through journals and articles. So this, what the court say, this kind of expert here is called an armchair expert. Right? This is an armchair expert. What does it mean by an armchair expert? Is referring to expertise of a person obtained by uh, uh, obtained through readings of textbooks and journal right so in this case when the court decided on whether I should take which opinion the court says that evidence of opinion of experts who carried out the experiments analysis and tests ought to have more credible as opposed to experts who do not have the benefit of doing analysis himself so in this case the court has provide justification I have read, I have listened to both of your justification, your analysis under section 51, and I decided that I want to up and follow the opinion of an expert from the prosecution because they are the one who do the analysis, they should know more. So because of that, that's why in Anwar Ibrahim's case, out of these two experts' opinion, the, pros, the, the judge basically followed the opinion of an expert's produced by the prosecution witnesses. You got the picture? So, that's how. So, if you look at uh, this PowerPoint, this PowerPoint here reflect as to how will the judge decide if you have conflicting expert opinion. Okay. Now, what are the duties of an expert? And what are the duties of a judge relating to expert opinion? Right? As we have discussed earlier, Whenever an expert gives evidence in the court, it is paramount that they have to give grounds for their opinion. So, experts must give reasons and justification for his opinion. Now, if they make bare assertion, now it will have no evidential value. Bear in mind, if a witness is giving evidence in the court, if an expert is giving evidence in the court, he may have the necessary qualification, his evidence will be relevant. Therefore, it may be admissible. But when we study about relevancy and admissibility, remember relevancy relates to admissibility, but another issue that is independent of relevancy and admissibility is the issue of weight. So what happened here is that it may be relevant and admissible, but I may not want to put any weight to it if you do not if, you, if the expert did not give any justification or reasoning of his opinion, the weight attached could be zero. So that is what it meant by that. Yeah? So if you only make bare assertion, you have no justification, well, your evidence may be relevant and can be taken in court, but the court may attach zero weight to it. Yeah? That is what it meant by the case of Lai Yong Kun. So matters of weight will be different. Right? Now look at the case of uh, Dr. Shan Muganathan against Puriya Sami. Okay, this case actually relating to fingerprint identify uh, fingerprint evidence. So you have an expert here because you have in the case of Dr. Shan Muganathan, 
you have a person who is dead right he has not he does not create any will but suddenly they produce a will so the issue here is whether the will is actually written down by the victim the, the dead person or not the deceased or not so what happened here is that they call an expert to determine whether the handwriting on that particular will is actually written by the deceased yeah? now in this case the court says that if you have expert giving evidence in the court the duty of an expert is only to assist the court to coming to its decision an expert may give reasons for decision but at the end of the day the court remains the final arbiter all right so you got that so that will be the duty of the expert that is to give reasons for decision now how about the duty of the judge now the duty of the judge, if you look at this PowerPoint, is number one, the judge must consider reasonings given by the expert. So the expert now, under section 51, required to give evidence in the court, required to give justification for his reasoning, for his opinion, and the judge has to look and consider the reasonings given by the, uh, the expert. But... At the end of the day, he has to form his own conclusion. Number two, yeah, the second judge's duty will be, the judge can only reject the expert opinion only after considering it. So, maknanya, the judge has to look into the opinion, consider it, then may decide to reject it. And number, number three here, the failure of the judge to consider expert opinion may lead to miscarriage of justice and retrial. Now, if you refer, if you recall the case of, sorry, uh, CGU insurance, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, we have studied this case of CGU insurance last time. If you remember, the case of CGU insurance is also relating about fire. So, it was fire. There was arson. Yeah? Uh, the issue here, whether uh, as to the time of fire, what is the cause of fire. Now, what happened in this case is that you have an expert witness here giving evidence in the court and the judge here did not evaluate that particular witness and failure of the judge to evaluate the evidence of that particular witness is actually amounting to um, mis, uh, failure to appreciate the facts and this amounting to miscarriage of justice okay you got that so that will be what happened in the case of CGU insurance. You have a look at the book there. It's, not, it's all there in the book. Okay? Now, so that will be basically what we have covered so far. Section 45 and opinion of decision of the uh, opinion of the judge, reasons for his, sorry, opinion of the expert. The justification will be under section 51. Now, another section that you can look at will be section 46. Also talk about opinion evidence. Now, section 46 says that facts bearing op upon opinion of experts, facts not otherwise relevant are relevant if they support or inconsistent with the opinion of experts, even such opinion are relevant. Now, what does this section mean? Yeah, if you have an expert here, if you have an expert here giving evidence in the court, when an expert gives evidence in the court, the expert may relate to some other evidence so the expert can refer to other evidence this other evidence can be in support of his own evidence or it can be inconsistent with his own evidence so contohnya right so he is giving evidence of finding in a journal so you may have a journal this finding in the journal basically support his opinion so the finding in the journal here is standard in court under section 46. Maknanya, you can title the journal as evidence in support of his opinion. Also, or if it is actually inconsistent with his opinion, that is also can be tendered got, uh, under section 46 as well. Right? So, you have that basically if you refer to the case here, you will find uh, these two cases can illustrate to you how section 46 operate. Okay? Now, so far, we have looked into evidence of expert. Remember evidence of expert, we are concerned with section 45, 46, 
and section 51. Opinion also can be given by non-expert. Right? Opinion also can be given by non-expert. So when you talk about a non-expert opinion, non-expert opinion, basically what you got to refer to, here will be a situation where a layman, a layman is giving evidence of opinion. Pandangan dia. Remember, a layman, if you ought to give evidence in the court, remember it has to be evidence of fact that you perceive. But in this situation, a layman here is giving evidence of opinion. Remember, as a general rule, it is not allowed. But if a layman giving evidence of opinion, it can be allowed if you fall under situation in section 47, section 48, section 49, and section 50. This will be a situation limited to a layman here giving non-expert opinion. Now, let's look at section 47. Now, section 47, let's read section 47. Section 47 is referring to opinion as to handwriting when relevant. When the court has to form an opinion as to the person by whom any document was written or signed, the opinion of any person acquainted with the handwriting of the person by whom it is supposed to have been written or signed, that it was or was not written or signed by that person is a relevant fact. Now, under section 57, you are talking about handwriting evidence. So, this is handwriting evidence. Now, you got to look at the case of Fakhrudin against state of MP. Right? So, in this case, what happened here is that when you are dealing with handwriting, whether this is the person's handwriting or not, handwriting can be proven in three ways according to the case of Fakhrudin. Number one, to prove that the handwriting is the handwriting of a person. Say, for example, you have a will. This particular will is handwritten. Yeah? Someone is claiming that this is not the will of the deceased. Yeah, another person is claiming that this is the will of a deceased genuinely written by him. So you have the dispute whether this, this will is written by the deceased or not. So that is the issue. Now, to prove that the handwriting of this will is the handwriting of the deceased, according to the case of Fakhrudin and section 47, and reading expert uh, opinion evidence as a whole, handwriting, the genuineness of handwriting can be proven by tendering an expert evidence under section 45. Now, if you refer to section 45 last time, look at 45. Yeah, you look at section 45, remember? Right, uh, you look at section 45 here, you have evidence relating to handwriting here. So, evidence relating to handwriting basically, the law says that you can have an expert proving evidence of handwriting, and you have that in the case of Said Abu Bakar. And some cases say that, of course, it is not going to be conclusive, but it has to be corroborated with other evidence. So, you can tender, you can prove handwriting via expert evidence. Secondly, you can prove handwriting by producing, look at section 47 here, an ordinary person, right? So you look at section 47, you are tendering a person who, who has, who is an ordinary person, a lay person giving evidence of handwriting under section 47. And this particular person who is giving evidence of handwriting under section 47 here must satisfy the explanation under section 47. Now, what is the explanation under section 47? The witness who is giving evidence of handwriting under section 47 must be someone who has seen the deceased wrote the will. That will be number one. You have seen the person wrote the will. Number two, look at the explanation. He has received documents purporting to be written by that person. Maknanya, the second one will be, your witness here has received the document written by the deceased, for example. And number three will be, right, documents purporting to be written by that person, so sorry, having habitually submitted to him, Right, the witness here basically 
have, have been receiving documents. Yeah, have been receiving documents that is written by the deceased. So, maknanya you are saying here, the lay person who is giving evidence of handwriting must have perceived evidence of handwriting either given by the deceased or so. Yeah, so that is the situation under section 47. Okay, so, alright, in that context, right, the evidence of handwriting can be tendered. Yeah, in the, in the court. And yeah, um, you can refer to various cases here. Right, quite a number of it. In the case of Lee Kim Luang, you can you have the case of PP against Muhammad Kasim bin Yatim. You also have the case of Chu Chun Moi and Ngan Siu Tin. Yeah, all that talk about evidence of handwriting. Remember, yeah, when you talk about evidence of handwriting under section forty seven. You can also cross refer to section 73 whereby section 73 you're talking about uh, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, comparison of a signature or handwriting maknanya you can have an original handwriting of a person in another document you compare that with the one in the will which is in dispute so you can tender it you have to cross refer to section 73 now, the second non-expert opinion is provided for in the section 48. Now, section 48 here is referring to, now let's look at 48. Opinion as to existence of right or custom when relevant. When the court has to form an opinion as to the existence of any general custom or right, the opinion as to the existence of such custom or right of persons who would be likely to know its existence are relevant. So you are talking about under section 48, you are talking about general custom or right. Right? This is not private custom or right. This is general customs of right. Uh, you look at the example there, the case of Kong Nen Siu. So you are talking about customs relating to Fu Chao customs, right? And okay, general, when you talk about customs here, Remember, when you talk about customs or right, it can either be by way of an opinion or it can either be by way of judicial notice. Last time when we studied about a judicial notice, you have customs or right. Say for example, you have some custom that has been practiced long, long time ago. Right? So anyone can give evidence of that. So you nak bagi orang tua yang sangat, ex, yang sangat tahu pas, berkenaan dengan that particular custom, you can. And if that person is caught, it will be under section 47. Okay? So that will be on, remember this is on general custom. All right. Okay. Now the other one will be under section 49. 49 here is referring to opinion as to the usage, tenets, etc. when relevant. Right? So this one will be, you're talking about the usage of tenets of anybody or man. Okay. This one here, you're talking about, uh, you have several cases in the notes there. On the use of, uh, here you have that. Uh, you're talking about the uh, Kebiasaan dia, dia adat dia, ya, dia punya adat dia, right? So you have the case of Lee Ti Chiang. The prosecution reliance on the evidence of police detective can also be regarded of evidence of uh, non-expert, ya. Also under section 15, last one will be evidence on opinion on relationship of the parties. So this one we have remember last time we study about section nine on evidence of relationship of parties. So when you talk about evidence of relationship of parties, this is actually related to opinion evidence. Yeah, it can be related to opinion evidence. You are, when you are talking about matters relating to reputation, for example, you have that in the case of Ong Cheng Niu and Yap Chiang Niu. So basically on this point, yeah. So on these four points here, four sections here, you can have a non-expert giving evidence of opinion. So it means that when you talk about opinion evidence, opinion evidence can be categorized into two. One is expert opinion confined to section 45, 46 and 51 and non-expert opinion under section 47 up until section 50. 
So non-expert opinion, you are dealing with lay person giving evidence of opinion. It can be allowed only in specific situation under section 47, 48, 49 and section 50. Okay, with this note, we completed our discussion on opinion evidence under section 45 up until 51.